Okay, welcome back for section eight of Unlocking Your Finances uh, When Budgeting is Not Enough conference. Um, this section is what is the kanaf? Now, that word kanaf is a Hebrew word. And in the Strong's Hebrew lexicon, which is H3671, it means wing and extremity, edge, winged, border, corner, or skirt. Um, a, for example, the corner of a garment. As you study that word out throughout scripture, um, you come to discover that the word kanaf in the Hebrew was a word picture of coming under the obedience of God's covenant. And that um, when we come under obedience to God's covenantal commandments, that is birthed out of holy fear of the Lord, we end up being protected. So for example, with uh, Psalm 91, a lot of times uh, that's quoted in um, churches. And pull it out. So here. So he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Surely he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings, knaf, shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And so what the Lord showed me um, as he had me learning this and learning to apply it in my life, that um, the wing is the covenant uh, as a whole. And the feathers were the individual laws. And it gave me a bit of a funny picture. If you have a covenant with no laws, it looks like a plucked chicken wing. And that chicken, or if you want to use a different animal, a plucked eagle's wing is not going to get any lift. At the same time, if all you have is a bunch of laws, you have a pillow fight on your hands because you have a big bag full of feathers of laws, but they're not connected to anything. And so this is where a lot of times legalism will get into uh, like Judaism or um, into more some of the messianic uh, groups that I've uh, come across in my journey that they have all these laws, but they're not connected with the covenant relationship with the most high God, with our heavenly father. And we enter into covenant a lot of times with scripture, it talks about the marriage covenant, that the church is the bride and Jesus Christ is the husband. Well, it is the father who gives the bride to the husband. And so when we have that marriage covenant, we have boundaries within marriage that says you're not going to go sleeping around because if you do, now you're committing adultery that you are going to give your heart to your husband and not to another person, not to another thing, not to um, various things that you can give your affections to, that your husband is supposed to have your heart. And so as we come under the covenant the kanaf of the Lord, that is where the blessings come from. And so, for example, if you read through Psalm 91 and you get to see the blessings and right now during the pandemic, the reality of verse six, well, even go back to verse five, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in the darkness nor for the destruction that wastes at noonday. 
And the last that I heard, I think there was 20,000 people that have died from this uh, coronavirus or the COVID-19, as they're calling it. Um, and we're literally getting to see verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. There is protection. There's provision of health. There's provision of life and life more abundantly from this pandemic right now. When we come under that relational covenant and we have the feathers attached to the wing, that we have the lift, you shall rise up as on ings or ings. I've been talking a little too much today. Rise up as on wings of eagles. You need to have the covenant relationship coupled with obedience to his commandments. Birthed out of love, birthed out of a heart desire, not burst out of striving or performance or trying to earn um, your husband's love. He already loves you so much. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. He loved you so much. While you were yet a sinner, he died for you to show you just how valuable and worthy you are. It's not what you do that gives you value. It is the price he was willing to pay for you that gives you value. And in his eyes, you were created in his image and he loves you so much. And nothing you can say or do will stop him from loving you. Sometimes loving you will hurt when we don't receive his love, when we reject it with our rebellion. But he will never stop loving you. And like the father of the prodigal, he is waiting. He is watching that the moment he sees you from far away coming home, he is there running to bring you into his embrace. He loves you so much. He is ready to give you back the mantle that you threw away. He's willing to give you the authority that you walked away from. He's willing to give you the shoes of the gospel of peace to go and share the restoration process that he has brought you through. He's willing to invite you into his home, into his dwelling place. It may not be a physical building. You might be called to the highways and the byways. I don't know who this is for, but he knows that you're watching. Whether now or on a replay, he knows you're going to hear this and he wants you to know how much he loves you. He never stopped loving you. He never gave up on you. When you gave up on him, he never gave up on you. And you do have a second chance. There's nothing that you have done that will block you from his love if you are willing to say, I've had enough of the pig pen. I'm done. I am tired of living in the pig pen. I want to go home. And he's waiting. And he said, yes, my son, come home. Yes, my daughter, come home. I will receive you. Even if others reject you, I will receive you. He loves you so much. He will move mountains to bring you back into his embrace. But it's your choice. Will you allow him to embrace you? Will you allow him to give you to lavish you with his love. Wow. <laughs> I don't know who that was for, but that was amazing. God loves you, man. Okay, let's try to get back on this topic. What is the Kanaf? Um, the Kanaf, the covering. Another story where we see 
this word, kanaf, is with Ruth and with Boaz. When Naomi told Ruth, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Go to him when he's at the barley threshing floor and come under his skirt. Now, back then, men wore different clothes than what they do today. Um, in the uh, more nomadic areas, you still see where the men wear. Um, they still have a kind of skirt. I know um, overseas in Asia, the men still wear their pakmas, their uh, wraps. It's just different styles than what the girls would wear. But when Ruth came under Boaz's skirt, um, under his garment, uh, some translate under his cloak, depending on which translation of the Bible you're reading, that um, she ended up receiving a double portion. Now, if people don't know the story of who on earth is Ruth and Boaz, um, Ruth was a Moabitess, which according to law, um, were they were um, rejected people. And um, when Naomi and her husband ended up going to the land of Moab um, to flee from the famine, they ended up, um, their Israelite sons took foreign wives. Ruth was one of them. Her husband died. Uh, she uh, and Naomi's husband also died. And so Naomi was going to return back to Israel and um, Ruth said, your God will be my God. Your land will be my land. I'm going to go with you. And um, she came back with Naomi to Israel. And so now you've got two widows. So they had, uh, by law, gleaners rights where they would be able to go to the fields and pluck up anything that the harvesters had forgotten. And um, she ended up uh, eventually at Boaz's field, which was a righteous man. And um, she was given favor by Boaz when he found out that it was Ruth who had accompanied Naomi back to Israel, which meant that Naomi probably ended up coming back alive because she was an older woman. She would have had to make that journey um, and trying to do it alone, you would have been at much more risk of the animals and the, the marauders and whatnot. And uh, so he showed favor to Ruth for what she had done for honoring Naomi. And um, that first day um, where it gives a measurement, it says that Ruth gleaned the equivalent of 20 quarts of barley. And now in the Bible, it doesn't say 20 quarts. It gives um, some biblical measurement. But when you translate it into modern day English, it's 20 quarts. Um, she did it by hand, which meant that her fingers were probably blistered, raw. Um, she was not used to being out in the fields. And yet she worked from sun up to sundown, she was willing to put in the effort. She was willing to sacrifice so that she and Naomi would have food on their tables. After she came under the covenant, um, under the uh, protection, under the provision of Boaz as her kinsman redeemer, he gave her 40 quarts, double portion, without effort because she came into covenant with him. And it was a covenant of intimacy. That act of coming under uh, his skirt was um, the best way that I understand it. Excuse me. Is like she was basically saying, I want to be married to you. Um, and so... I guess she sort of proposed to him in that case. Um, but it opened her up to 
uh, double portion of provision without striving, without performance. And this is what God wants to offer to each and every one of us. Um, that when we come under his covenant, and God says that his burden is easy and his yoke is light. Or it might be the other way. Um, yeah, I don't have that scripture reference for you. Um, but another verse here in Ruth, chapter 2, verse 12. It says, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. So she came under his wing, under his garment, but Boaz declared to her that she had come under the covering, under the wing, under the covenant of the most high God. And that's what opened up the provision. He recognized it. And he in turn blessed. So um, there's other scripture references throughout the Bible. Um, you can, uh, if you have the manual, I'm looking at page 18. And you can look at those yourself. And also just do a study through the strong Concordance on the word Kanaf. Um, the spelling I have is K-A-N-A-P-H. And uh, you'll see all the way through scripture where this theme is. And uh, you can get such a rich understanding that 16 minutes here, I don't have enough time to unpack deeply. But God wants to welcome you under his kanaf so he can pour out a double portion upon you. So um, my little ones are still napping. So I'm going to keep barreling through here and uh, move into the next section. And uh, I will be back momentarily for section number nine.